Welcome back to the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Bubble. With me uh, once again is 411 Steve Cook. And uh, Steve, we are heading back in the time machine uh, as we sort of teased on our previous episode of the podcast. Uh, we were talking about the Vice Versa uh, China documentary. And somehow you and I got to the uh, talking about the first WWE draft. And we decided, well, I was talk about the whole thing. And um, we have decided to do that. And uh, it should be an interesting look back here at uh, the first edition of the draft. Lots of speculation that uh, WWE is going to be doing uh, their usual, I guess, annual draft at this point here in a couple months. Uh, we thought we'd, we'd get a head start and look back at the 2002 one, which, uh, to be honest with you, I think the, um, the roster was a little bit different uh, in terms of uh, WWE building up stars with the 2002 draft. Things were a little bit different back then. Life was a little bit different back then. <laughs> Blake, I'll tell you what. In 2002, when this thing took place, I was a senior in high school. How about that? How about that? Man, those were, those were some good times, I think. Possibly the high points of uh, certainly one of the high points of my life. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of high points. I not don't mean to brag, but I do, <laughs> do a lot of good stuff. What can I say? But yeah, 2002 was a pretty good year for me. Lots of good stuff going on. And uh, it was just before I jumped onto the 411 mania message board i remember you know stone nine cold was a big thing back then chris hyatt doing his thing back in 2002 oh yeah the memories bring back the memories there joshua groot all kinds of good stuff going on and a lot of good stuff going on the wdf as well at the time it's still the world wrestling federation at this point in time yes they Which haven't got the f that. out yet they had not gotten the f out just yet that would be uh, pretty soon it is a strange point in history too and uh while I'm kind of blabbering on for a minute, we call it 2002. Uh, we're coming off WrestleMania X8 with uh, Triple H and Chris Jericho and, oh, the Rock and Hulk Hogan, that, that whole deal. Uh, NWO, just a lot of interesting stuff going on that we'll dive into right now. Yes, uh, it did. The the first edition of the draft, uh, the draft lottery, whatever, how they, they called it, it happened eight days after WrestleMania 18, which, as we all know, uh, was a very interesting card. Rock Hogan, uh, Triple H, Jericho, main events, uh, all, all that good stuff. But it took place eight days after on Raw, and it's the March 25th, uh, 2002 edition of Raw. And uh, it was very interesting because I think the like the draft concept itself, I think that was something, and, and for WWE to even sort of like consider a brand split like this is like now we're so used to you know it, it's kind of been ingrained after all these years but like i think back and i was like man this it just felt so different because you just were not used to this you know you had seen all of the the big stars and, and all the you know everyone just on the same shows and um it, it was going to be different and I, i'm trying to think back like to what my actual thoughts were but i was thinking like you know when you see this draft and, and we'll go through the picks and everything that happened on this raw but it's like I don't even remember what I was thinking at the time, but I was like, surely, you know, this is going to be pretty fun because you basically have two brands, I guess, going, you know, in different directions. And um, it was a lot more, it was a lot more intriguing, I think, uh, for the first installment than it is uh, however many installments later at this point. Well, even back then, I remember thinking that it was pretty much their attempt to try to uh, try to have another war, like another Monday Night War, because after... After Dex W had gone out of business, and after East W had gone out of business, and everybody had gone to work for WDF, I think they quick re quickly realized that man, we 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 need the we need some kind of uh, competition or something. We need something different going on here because we just got everybody under one roof. It was a bloated roster, just like it's a bloated roster now, and it's been a bloated roster for them pretty much ever since. So separating to Raw and SmackDown, it made sense to me as a fan of time because I, I, I figured, I kind of thought, hey, it'll give more of these guys, more of these girls a chance to uh, step up and get main event slots and whatnot. So I was, I was all about it. And to this day, I've always been somebody that's, I'm pro brand split, pro uh, roster extension, pro anything that makes these shows different from each other. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the thing is like different, like because that that to me, I don't know, like we remember and, you know, we'll we'll talk more about it, I'm sure as we go along, but it, it really started to sort of separate, you know, at the first at the beginning of this draft, like as we'll go through and look at these rosters, like there were some distinctions in terms of 
you, you sort of, you know, of course, the SmackDown six that became, you know, the thing. And when you kind of look at the rosters and everything and how they shaked out. I mean, it was just, it, they were different with that. Like, because, you know, you remember kind of what we had with Raw and, and all these other things. And I think just the difference, um, that was such a big deal then. Whereas now I, I almost feel like you've seen, you know, so many matches. And of course, it's much different. Like the rosters we know, they're just completely different. And I feel like now it's, there, there's just so many rematches. Like we've seen all these matches in WWE before for the most part. And there's just a lot of those you know, that we've seen, it's like, well, even if you do a brand split, you're like, well, I've already seen this. And, and at the time you had it, you didn't have that feel, I think at the time. And that's what, you know, that's what made it so different because you, you hadn't seen some of these things before with, with some of these people on different brands. And I think what we failed, some of us may fail to realize what happened eventually. And we probably should have realized is that no matter how a roster is split up, no matter how many different brands you have, they're going to have the tendency to put the same people against each other over and over again. Yeah. That's just, that's just been their way uh, forever. Basically they just, you know, you see the same matches over and over again. You can get hell, go back to the eighties. They had the same matches over and over again, all over the United States of America. So they're just, it's just kind of the way they are. I, 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 I sound like Dave Meltzer here kind of stammering out. Yeah, it is what it is. You know, that sort of, I don't know why I'm, channeling Meltzer here i did take a look at the observer from back in that time so that's, that's where it came comes from yeah well i'm there were some good notes uh in there in terms of looking at some of this stuff but if we do start with this actual show here um the march 25th 2002 edition like it opens in in a really i mean a very uh interesting way where you've got linda mcmahon sort of being the one to set everything up you've got you know all the superstars in the locker room vince of course is picking for smackdown rick flair in charge of picking for Raw. Um, the ones that they noted would not be eligible for the draft uh, were going to be Triple H, Jericho, Stephanie, because they're going to be in the main event we're going to talk about here in just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> what a, yeah. I, going back and watching that, I'm just like, boy, I can't wait to get to that one. Um, also, Austin was not in there either. Um, she had mentioned because of his contract and everything. And, uh, his uh, contract. Yeah, <laughs> right, quote, unquote. The, uh, the contract situation. Um, so that was the reasoning behind that. So those four were not eligible. Um, and that led us into like the very first match. We, this is what I joked about last week. And I think this is what actually jump started this idea for us to, to go back and look at this. The Taz versus Mr. Perfect match. Um, just I don't recall of... that being the reason we went back to that. I don't, I don't recall you well, mentioning Taz not. versus Mr. Perfect because I know I was shocked <laughs> when I saw that come out. Like, what the? We got Taz and Mr. Perfect. One of the, the most hell? random, like, right? If you think about it, like, this this would, to me was like the ultimate. If you wanted to know what WWE's roster looked like in 2002, <laughs> like, this is it. You had Taz, you had Mr. Perfect. Uh, it was a very short match, but uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that I did put down was, um, of course, I think they were still at the time hyping up the Forcible Entry CD. Yes. Uh, and, of course, Taz's music was on there. Forcible Entry, I think a, a very underrated gem in the, uh, I guess, WWE uh, CD pantheon there. There's some, some good stuff there. And uh, both guys in interesting periods of their career there. Taz, uh, you know, we remember Taz as a human suplex machine in ECW. I think most of us tend to remember that part of Taz's career more than we remember him uh, feuding of Jerry Lawler. And coming out wearing a bowling shirt and uh, and track pants and whatnot <laughs> towards the end there, and then you had Mister Perfect who randomly had a big return in 2002 Royal Rumble, and he was looking pretty good there for a while. Yeah, and it looked like he was kind of having a late career renaissance. And then not too long after this, they took a plane ride, and <laughs> things things went downhill from there for for Kurt Hennig. It is a bad ending from from right there but at this moment in time it looked like mr perfect was at least heading right direction yeah the uh there, there's a nice segue for hey if you want to go back and listen to our dark side of the ring reviews uh, from yeah the there first we go half of the season that'll be coming up later on <laughs> yes for that that one we will be getting to uh once dark side of the ring returns in september which oddly enough maybe around the time the draft takes place um but uh yeah taz versus mr perfect that was just one of those Again, you, you go back and look through this entire show, and it's like, Taz, Mr. Perfect, that's just not a match you would have ever thought you would see, and you didn't really see a whole lot of it. You didn't see a whole lot. They weren't really, <laughs> didn't seem like they're really on the same page. It was no. just uh, kind of a it was kind of a cluster. Yeah, Taz. Two guys, was a, no chemistry there at all. 
no, quick win from Taz. And again, this is that's kind of the theme of the show where there's a lot of these matches don't really get a lot of time. But um, here's here's one of the best right after that match. Here's what I love about it. Like, you know, Art Anderson, he's he's playing it up, baby. He's not going to um, you know, he's not putting anything down. Like if he's going to be in a draft, he's going to be working the phones. And that's exactly what Art Anderson was doing uh, backstage. Of course, Flair had his war room. Vince had his war room. Um, and that led us into the number one pick, which looking back, I mean, I guess you can make sense why Vince is going to pick the rock, uh, for his number one pick on SmackDown. That led into, uh, a nice little, uh, segment with those two, uh, Vince making all these rules about what rock can and can't do. Can't say it doesn't matter. Can't, you know, shove a foot up his candy ass and all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but then I think rock started a, a, you're an asshole chant. Uh, that's, that's a unique one. Um, not just asshole. You are an asshole. You are an asshole for Penn State. We are Penn State. <laughs> yes. Like I got a question about this, and I, you can't argue the Rock being the first pick. If right. you take a look at that roster, um, that holds up. Rock's still the biggest star out of all of them. No doubt about that. But uh, this kind of reminds me of when football teams they'll draft somebody because they're you know they're, they're the best player on the board, but they shoot try to shoehorn them into their system. Yeah. They do not try to use that football player to, they'll try to use their best skills. Like yeah. Vince doesn't want Rock saying it doesn't matter. He doesn't want Rock sticking people with his boots up people's candy asses. That's what the Rock does. That's what he's good at. That's why he's the top player on the board. And yeah, just that just seems like one of his out of touch football coaches that thinks that everybody has to play by his system. Yeah, you gotta you gotta take a pocket quarterback and try to make him a dual threat. You can't do it. Dumb. You gotta dumb. You gotta you gotta play to his strengths. Um. So that was Vince, though, this entire way. I mean, of course, Vince is playing the heel, as as usual, and uh, really playing this up with Rock. And um, that, you know, this this was pretty much how the entire draft went, where one would make a pick, we'd go straight to the other and make the pick. So Flair comes out. Uh, his first pack, or his first pick is uh, The Undertaker, uh, which, of course, as we know, at the time, um, <laughs> Flair and Undertaker were not, you know, on the best of terms on storyline-wise in WWE, and uh, Taker throwing the chair and all this stuff. So. I mean, I, you know, Rock makes sense. I mean, Undertaker again. I feel like Flair. Hey, I mean, Rick American Flair. Badass Undertaker, though. I mean, yeah. I mean, hmm. Well, there's some you still had on the board here, and uh, <laughs> I think for Flair, this would be a theme for him. He didn't exactly uh, start off the night great, and I can't say that his draft strategy got a whole lot better. Uh, no, Flair. To... <laughs> Flair was thinking it with his uh, with his heart instead of his head for most of the season. Yeah. Which has been a kind of problem for Ric Flair in the past. <laughs> Arn Anderson was, I guess you can't say Arn Anderson was a whole lot of help here. He's working the phones and trying to get things done. And Rick's just out here, you know, doing what he does. Yeah, I think Rick's just reacting to what Vince is doing. Um, so you kind of saw that here. And yeah, again, there's just a lot of back and forth. Vince is pissed off that Flair took Taker. Uh, and then you've got the, you know, tying Vince and Kurt Angle together. Uh, Vince, you know, pissed or Kurt Angle's pissed off because Vince didn't pick him first. And uh, eventually that would lead to Vince actually picking Kurt uh, with his second pick after Flair picks the NWO. Before that, though, we, we get to that, Steve. Another kind of one of those weird assortment matches of talent. Um, Edge and DDP versus Christian and Booker <laughs> T. What about what a tag team match? That, that is that's an interesting one. Um <laughs> <laughs> that you know you got some interesting mixtures there i mean edge and christian of course were a tag team forever um you know booker t and christian i remember having a bunch of matches later on ddp and christian had a few at this point i guess Ed, edge and booker t were feuding over shampoo at this point that was these were things that actually <laughs> happened the european title was involved somewhere i was just i was shocked honestly that ddp got to hit the diamond cutter because yeah. ddp uh let's be honest this dojf run uh, not exactly the high point of his career by any stretch of the imagination. The guy was a glorified jobber for most of it, let's be honest. I mean, he won the European title, don't get me wrong. but uh, And he did stalk The Undertaker's wife. So He did I mean... stalk The Undertaker's wife, and uh, yeah, <laughs> things did not go well for DDP there. But uh, And believe it, I, I was shocked to see it. he also took the fall in this match. Shocking. Yes. I had to guess who it would have been. It would have been DDP. I was, it was nice to hear Christian's old music again from back in the day. That was good. Yeah. And Booker T I, I, had the same song for like his whole career, pretty much. Yeah, Edge was Rob Zombie. Like, I forgot about that too. Yeah, that's another um, another that forced entry? Forceful entry. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. I thought it was. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like you look back and you're like, you know, WWE is looking for stuff to do during the invasion and all that. And it's like, couldn't you've done like Edge and Christian versus Booker T and DDP, but instead you had, you know, of course you switch them all around. Yeah, 
you had the shampoo, you had DDP Sock and Taker's wife, and it would have made too too much sense to have two of your biggest uh, WCW stars up against uh, you know one of your best tag teams. But well, that was I mean that would made sense back uh, in two thousand one <laughs> when they were uh, completely yes. screwing up their invasion build. I mean, yes, that, but that by now been... we got DDP as the motivational speaker. Uh, <laughs> We got Edge and Booker T again. They're feeding over shampoo. I don't remember what else they were doing. And Edge Christian was mm-hmm. still. I, I I guess Christian was. Who you know who the fuck knows? I was gonna say I don't remember what, but I do remember like DDP. It's like I don't know what they like. They clearly had no idea what to do with this guy. They had nothing for him. He was just there to be there. Yeah, he was just there for the name. Um, the poor but... guy, and he also you remember the poor guy. He jumped out on his Time Warner deal because a lot of those WWE guys took that guaranteed money and sat out for a while. And DDP was just so excited about, uh, you know, this whole invasion deal and getting to be the big star that he just had to, uh, you know, he's like, no, I'm good. I'll jump over to the F. And wow, they sure reward him for that. Yeah, not not too much of a reward uh, there. And uh, as we'll see, it wasn't exactly he, he wasn't exactly a a, a prime uh, candidate here in the in the draft either uh, in terms of uh, his pick status. So um, as we said, uh, Vince. Vince's um, Angle and Vince are still losing their minds and everything, and um, Angle's basically convinces Vince to draft him uh, because he's think because he says Flair's going to take him, and so Flair takes the NWO. That causes Vince to get mad because he wanted the NWO, um, and so you have why? The and, and I know that's what like it again. We're talking about like why would he want that? Like, but I. But again, it's they were taking like, orders for him, from him. But let's be honest, it's not the uh, not the prime of the NWO. No, Scott Nash Hall on his way X-Pac. out. Nash X Pac had come back the week before. It's just you know Nash on X Pac. It's just not the uh, not the best group there. I don't know. No, I, I don't think so. Um, but speaking but of random what, picks, exactly. I was gonna say, yeah, like, a random one coming up here. Well, and it's like <laughs> this is what I mean. Like if you compare thus far, like it's just like the two shows had a pretty distinct feel like a couple picks in because Vince has already got rock and angle. Uh, Flair's got taker and the NWO. And then angle basically makes a suggestion for to Vince to pick someone who has not been around for a while. And then Vince yeah. gets his confidence up. And who does he pick? Chris Benoit. Um, so Chris Benoit, Which, number three, you pick. know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. And at the time I, I, in 2002, I was a Benoit fan, but yeah. even at the time it seemed like, you know, they probably could wait on the pick. Yeah, I, I think don't... they took him. They probably took him a little bit too early there. I think, although I think you'd have to look in the SmackDown Six era. The pick did end up panning out. Yes. Benoit did end up being a viable competitor for SmackDown, and you could make the argument that maybe Flair and Anderson would have, would have drafted him because of the Horseman connection. I think he could wait a few rounds. I don't know. Considering who is going to go here in a couple picks, um, yes, I think probably for. Him to go above one of these other people. Uh, it's it's an interesting pick, but uh, so that you basically got bickering still with the NWO and Flair. Again, that's just this common theme with Flair thus far. He's drafted people who don't like him. He's drafted four guys who do not like him at all. Um, so I don't know what his strategy is here, but and then he uh, picks Kane, which I don't know at the time. I can't even remember it that far. I don't, I don't know if Kane, Kane liked him or not. Couldn't tell you. <laughs> who knows? Um, Kane didn't really like too many people. So no. Either. And Kane, it's still mass can at this point, yeah. Yes, uh, still, still mass Kane. Uh, Kane directed but... the pick. He's going to deal with the NWO directly, which I'm sure led to a lot of fantastic matches between Kane and the NWO. <laughs> yeah, I remember a lot of great uh, Kane and uh, I just yeah X Pac X Pac and Kane matches. I think those were uh, several years before. Uh, yeah, I mean you. there is a connection there. <laughs> Little history. Uh, Trish Stratus versus Ivory. Uh, we got that as the second match of the night. Um, and, uh, to make sure everyone knew that it was 2002, uh, we want puppies chance all over the place. Um, and, uh, this was another one, like another short match, all these, all these matches thus far. Sorry. That was the third match of the night. Um, I mean, all these matches just very short, like we said, cause we know the whole focus is on the draft. Um, basically nothing in this Trish and Ivory match, uh, worth noting in my opinion. Um, uh, uh, this era Trish is always worth noting. Let's well, be honest. that's true. Gosh, almighty. Um, and I'm, we're going to get to that in a second. Actually, that's a great segue because <laughs> they did show a video too for the uh, 2002 Diva swimsuit issue with Trish on the cover, and uh, I I never bought that one. Not not at all. Um, but that was yeah, not a whole lot happening there. Uh, oh, right before that, uh, after the the match, Vince picks Hogan. So so Hogan is the number. <laughs> 
what is he the number four pick for smackdown um i just i don't even know what to say he like, went after the he went after that vanilla midget brother yeah what the uh hell? So vince picks hogan maybe did that just to piss hulk <laughs> off you know because uh, they were they were not exactly good friends at that point all their vince said the rest of the end of you know is back and tall he did not have hulk hogan and uh yeah, that leads to a lot of stuff between Hogan and Vince later on, which is uh, certainly, there were certainly things that happened. Here's my question. I don't remember the lead up here, so forgive me. Um, I didn't watch every Raw and SmackDown leading up to this. I did watch this Raw, but like this was eight days after WrestleMania. And considering mm-hmm. that what we saw at WrestleMania, we think Hogan is going to be the number four pick for SmackDown, but overall he's going to be the one, two, three, um, let's see, six, seven, eight. He's going to be the number nine pick overall. Do we not draft this guy a little bit higher, you think? Uh, I, I mean, it's kind of an upset that he went after the rest of his NWO guys. I will yeah, say that because, I mean, he went after Hall, Nash, and X-Pac. And you kind of thought Hogan was kind of the big star of that group. And as we found out later, later this month, it all becomes irrelevant because, well, Triple H faces Hulk Hogan at the uh, Backlash pay-per-view. <laughs> and, okay, that, that whole thing, I'm Younger sorry. Younger old. But, the whole thing of having this champion, I'm, uh, oh gosh, that, don't get me started. I'm about to get started because these people up in Canada decided to cheer for Hulk Hogan for 25 minutes. They decided to make him a big uh, baby face superstar again. And based off that, they decided to put the WWF Championship on Hulk Hogan at, what was he, like 80, 86 years old at this point? Maybe <laughs> 87, something like that. And it's just, the people, uh, people buying tickets loved it, don't get me wrong. But the people sitting there and watching the shows, we've been sitting there watching WWF for years, and we kind of bought into that whole thing where guys like Hogan and people of his era were washed up and not worth it anymore. And then he comes back in and takes the title. Like, ugh, it just, it killed, it killed it. Well, don't worry. He would lose it a month later. I was at Judgment exactly. Day. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That, and- that- <laughs> You're talking about a crowd turning on someone like the crowd I was around, like everyone hated Hogan. Like they were just like, get the belt off this. Oh, guy. he's got off on that match too, wasn't he? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was not a great match. Um, <laughs> but that was a pretty, that's a pretty stacked card. Uh, you had, of course, Undertaker win the title from Hogan. Um, you had, I think, I'm trying to remember, of course you had the edge and angle. That was the hair versus hair match. Um, Triple H Jericho in a cell where Tim White takes the bump. Uh, some, a lot of other stuff happened on that. But Lesnar's on that card. I think he fought. I think he fought the Hardys, maybe. Um, that sounds right. Handicap match, maybe. And then I think he had RVD and Eddie. So like again, when, there you go. Like that was. I mean, look at the card on that. Like just. But then you had the rematch from this Tuesday in Texas. Oh yeah, the rubber match. I was excited to get that eleven years later. I was the really waiting for the to the score, if you will. <laughs> Speaking of RVD, um, he was Flair's next pick. So. Uh, Flair counters Vince with uh, Hogan with RVD, which I think is fine. He picked um, the title. Smart. Yeah, Intercontinental title. And that was the thing. And, of course, that sets up Angle's like, well, Intercontinental title becomes exclusive to Raw. Well, Angle's like, well, let me fight RVD for the title. So they're going to do that later on um, to try to get the uh, IC title on SmackDown. Well, that leads sense. to It does make sense. Like Good that. Booking. Very sensible. Um, Rock and Hogan, they are backstage. They shake hands in the locker room. Um, Hogan wants to team up with The Rock and take on the NWO. So, uh, wow, there's yeah. our next match. Uh, we, you know, have Rock and Hogan versus uh, the NWO right before that, though. We can't forget this. Uh, Vince picking Billy and Chuck, who are the tag team champions. So You can't forget Billy and Chuck. No. Um, that they, they did. Like, I think they got a lot of mileage out of the brand split. I think they, they're right up there with, um, I mean, they were in a lot of memorable stuff, I think, throughout the the brand split era so um, there you there you have it then you know also smart you have tag team champions and you know as much as i crapped on hogan earlier, earlier up there i did enjoy the rock and hogan catch catching up backstage yes. and stealing at there's each other's catch ranges. that's fun that's cool <laughs> that i have no problem with that no, although i and... still wonder why hogan took longer than he should have to shave that stupid beard off <laughs> i mean couldn't he just couldn't he just ditch the hollywood hulk hogan thing right after wrestlemania because he is a baby face can just be hulk hogan you know that's probably hulk's, probably part of why it's so stupid hulk's made a lot of questionable decisions i don't know if you can really well uh, yeah no doubt about that um, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least um rock and hogan versus the nwo uh there's a match that uh you know again what a yeah, what a setup fine. that is yeah and you still well, had short. hogan with yeah, i mean all these matches were short um voodoo child still had hogan with the voodoo child so um i think it was actually when you listen back on the 
whatever you watch it on peacock now or whatever it's uh dubbed over with yeah the peacock music. they have some garbled nonsense yeah yeah just generic stuff but that's not surprising uh this was i mean look this was not a masterpiece it was short but like the crowd was insane i, I wrote that down i was like i mean this is like peak right here like the crowd's just nuts obviously it wasn't wrestlemania 18 but people loved him some rock and hogan so i did hate the i hate the finish though because x-pac uses some yeah. nunchucks and starts cheating and whatnot and then you got Kane coming down because Kane's good to fit. He's going to target the NWO, which is fine. Yeah. But they disqualify Hogan and Rock because I guess the referee was one smart enough to see X Pac use the nunchucks. Yeah. Just, I mean, you know, a schmoz finish in what you are so used to, probably. And, I don't and know you can't, but and why do you have a schmoz finish when these guys are changing shares anyway? You got one side going Rock. I guess they want, they got to keep everybody strong, which I, I, I think Hogan and Rock be okay taking a fall. I was going to say, like, I think, could, I mean, <laughs> Xbox is probably okay pin. taking the pin here. Like, I think Xbox could have took a pin. You think Xbox, you know? I think Xbox is okay. Yeah, May Scott Hall could take a pin. Yeah, like, even Hall at this point. Like, I think he could have took the pin. And, and if Nash could have managed to take a bump, he could take a pin, probably. Yeah. Well, uh. Speaking of brand split stuff, that, um, boy, Raw, Nash, whoo. There was, there was some interesting oh, things He's there. a good dude, but man, he was rough at this point. Yeah, this there was, uh, that's when the, I think it's 2003, whatever, when it started to really get into the Triple H Nash stuff. But um, oh boy. anyways, after this, Vets accuses Flair of stealing his picks. Um, then they just go on basically a picking spree here <laughs> where it's just like they just get pissed off. and like, we got we to gotta get these picks in quick. Uh, Flair picks Booker T, Vince picks Edge. Flair picks the big show. Vince picks Rikishi. <laughs> um, and Flair had a great yeah. Flair had a great line here. Um, after Vince picks Rikishi, um, <laughs> Flair says maybe he'll put his, his fat ass on Vince's face. Uh, I didn't know that. That's a great line. Then Vince pushes Flair down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Flair's taking the bump off Vince, of course, because why, why wouldn't he? Flair's taking the bump in the first ever draft, uh, so nothing's changed in that regard. No, uh, no, so just no, lo- lots nice. of big, yeah, lots of exchanging of picks here um, with that, and then we did get Jeff Hardy uh, versus Billy. There's a, another interesting one, um, another short match that just furthered the storyline here, um, where you know, I which I think know. ended anyway. Because I was yeah. gonna say they were, <laughs> it really didn't do a whole lot, but um, yeah, this was a very short match, pretty much nothing to it. Flair, and then here we go. Like, this would become the theme. We know a future WWE drafts, and it all started here. Um, and poor Devon. Flair picks Bubba. Vince counters by picking Devon. Um, and so they show Bubba and Devon both angry in the locker room, and then they just hug randomly. Bubba walks out. Um, of yeah, course, I noticed that Goldust and Tommy Dreamer were pretty shook up about it, too. Yeah, they weren't happy. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it, too, too, was just funny having everyone in the locker room, like, in true, like, these guys just, I don't know, like, uh, I'm all for the kayfabe. Come on, give give me a give me a face locker room, give me a heel locker room. Um, but well, that that Devon singles around there, that's that's pretty good. Well, it 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 helped someone. I don't think it helped <laughs> Devon, but <laughs> the, the Reverend Devon didn't get yeah. quite. Uh, it, it didn't help the Reverend. He had some good theme music. I don't know. Well, it helped the Deacon. Uh, it didn't didn't help the Reverend, but I'm um, sure Bruce Pritchard is a big fan of the Reverend. Yeah, uh, probably so. Um, so. <laughs> This split was not well thought out, and I think as we've seen over the years, um, you know, this the split in and of itself, uh, not a great idea. Uh, see Otis, Tucker, um, and many more uh, throughout the years, I think, uh, with that. Uh, Rikishi versus William Regal. The you European know, I was match. looking forward to this match because when right. I saw these two fuckers walk out, like Rikishi <laughs> and William Regal, wow, what the hell, what the hell kind of match is this going to be? I was like, oh my God. Well, as it turns guess out, what? it didn't matter. Yeah, it didn't matter. <laughs> you didn't have to worry about it. Because <laughs> before the match even starts, uh, Brock Lesnar gets the ring. Yes, Brock Lesnar. Um, he attacks Rikishi and hits the F5. Uh, Heyman comes in, raises Brock's hand. Uh, I did put in my notes. I must have just been really on a kick when I watched this uh, a few days ago. Uh, an easy title defense for William Regal, uh, who successfully Very retained easy. Yes. thanks to, uh, to Brock Lesnar um, going crazy. And then. Here's here's what I really enjoyed because I remember this and I'm gonna test your your trivia here because you may have do you remember so Jazz is at WWF New York. Um yeah, she, she is. wants she wants to kick someone's ass because she's the women's champ. Do you remember that WWE had some kind of game on the computer? I don't remember what it was, what it was called, but it was like you were able to like tour WWF New York. I have no idea. I must have been the only one that did this because all I remember was 
it was the buggiest game I think I've ever tried to play on a computer. Uh, it was terrible, and that's all I remember. So I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I missed out on that one. I, yeah, I, don't, well, know, I don't know if met all, all that. I do know that Jazz uh, was pretty excited to end up on both shows. She's going to be the only bitch appearing on both shows. I remember saying that because, yeah. you know, you got to say bitch a few times if you're going to be a uh, a good champion and heal. Well, they are. They have not forgotten that memo. Um, no, uh, no, they haven't. AEW hasn't either. So there you go. No, that's the <laughs> that's the buzzword. Bitch is the buzzword. <laughs> um that's when you know you're in a you're in a hot feud is when you can say that in a promo um so we we mentioned brock and vince announces brock as his next pick in the draft you want to talk about there's a steal right value you're getting value there yeah that's a good idea but there's a problem (laughs) (laughs) there there is uh, a bit of a problem for vince because it's actually rick flair's pick so uh flair is the one who uh, picks Brock and then uh, Vince counters with Mark Henry. Um, you know what, though? Vince said that Rick could have had two picks instead of picking Brock. And if I was Rick, yeah. I would take him up on that. I would take him two picks. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. just that's me. Time. Yeah, I probably would have been a bad idea. Um, Vince picks Mark Henry. Flair picks Regal. Uh, <laughs> Vince picks Maven, <laughs> who is the hardcore champion. Yeah. The <laughs> wow. By the way, <laughs> I mean, this guy's not that far removed from eliminating The Undertaker. So, well, I mean, you know. <laughs> Not that far. So. Not that, yeah, yeah, that was a thing that happened. And then Flair's last pick, um, or was this his last pick of the evening? Yes, yeah, so it was yes. the uh, last pick on this number, particular television show. Number twenty is Lita. So there you go. Um, yeah. And Ben, by the way, again, things that have changed in uh, nineteen years. Vince just mocks Flair for picking a woman. Uh, with his last pick. Um, so there you go. He's a lascivious pig, which uh, <laughs> certainly Vince would know nothing about. Well, and then what does Vince <laughs> do after that? He suggests that Flair wants to sleep with Lita. Um, so which Vince goodness. would know nothing about trying to sleep with Divas. No, well, we never seen no, that. We didn't get that. Any, you know, Tori Wilson, Trish, uh, none of that. Sable. Um, so <laughs> Hell, Candace Michelle. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, so Vince, they're still playing up the whole thing, and we didn't really mention this, but everyone's basically playing up throughout the show that they're going to be the ones to land Austin uh, or whatever, and Flair starts the You Are an Asshole chant again, which I just don't think that chant was ever going to catch on. Um, Not outside Penn State. The asshole one works. It's pretty simple, but You Are an <laughs> Asshole, a little tougher to pull off. He's so going to work at Penn State, but nowhere else. Well, there's... Um, and barely Penn State, yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah, it didn't really take off that well, I don't think. Kurt Angle versus Rob Van Dam. So Kurt, as we said earlier, the setup is he's trying to get the Intercontinental title um, to SmackDown so it can be exclusive there. And uh, JR and, and the King remind us, though, that the draft lottery is after Raw on WWE.com. You better believe that I was on WWE.com <laughs> afterwards waiting to see the rest of this. By the way, um, speaking of JR and King, why were they talking about Nicole Kidman's nipples during this match? Were they? Yeah, there was I some kind of reference that. to it, and I have no idea why we're like. Was there a thing that called Kidman's nipples in two thousand two? Well, it probably wasn't in two thousand two. It probably was in like ninety six or ninety seven. Because <laughs> you know, sometimes there's Vince is about seven years behind. Sometimes <laughs> um, he's yeah. gotten a lot more current now, though. Um, so I don't know. If hey, you he's, saw at, it. Uh, some, he's at the Dave Chappelle show now. I so was going to say like, what, that's a few years uh, removed. So you I'm, read my mind. Like uh, that was as we're taping this on Sunday. Um, that was one of the things that come out. Was you that, know, you're cool, and Vince McMahon is a tangy comedy show. Like, Vince looked, I don't want to say normal, but, like, uh, Vince looked like a, I mean, he looks old. but Yeah, he didn't look good. <laughs> he does look somewhat like he's not wearing, you know, I don't remember the last time I've seen Vince not wearing a suit. Um, maybe it was in the segment with, with Tori or Trish or Candace. So, um, oh, gosh. Man. Maybe that's it. But, so, yeah, this is RVD, Kurt Angle. Um, of course, Kurt's big plan, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, but this is sort of the... The start of the, uh, you know, Edge and Kurt Angle feud. So Edge gets involved here um, and you already, you know, you set up a future feud on SmackDown, which I thought, you know, good idea. Um, So we get the DQ here. Edge gets involved. All this good stuff. And um, so, yeah, just the finish was very weird, wasn't it? Like, I think Angle had shoved Tim White in front of him. Yeah. Um, angle hit the angle slam, angle lock, but White called for the bell. So well, basically, just, Tim White realized that Tim yeah. White is smart enough to realize that Kurt Angle pushed him in front of RVD on, on purpose. Which you know, most yeah. referees that is a strange <laughs> decision for a WF referee because most of them are not smart enough to figure it out. This is not Tim White's first barbecue, though. No, he's aware of what Kurt Angle is trying to do. Well, 
speaking of storylines, boy, Tim White would have some storylines. Um, yeah, oh boy. <laughs> this, this era, Whitney. Uh, and like I said, he would he would take a fall off the sale and uh, not too long after. So, I mean, this guy, yeah, uh, very interesting. So, um, so this, yeah, that sets up the the future feud that they're going to have with with Edge and Angle, and uh, they'd run that for a couple months, like we said, basically um, leading up to that hair versus hair match Judgment Day. Um, and then now it's time for the main event. If you're going to have one main event on the biggest draft edition ever, your first ever one, you really want to have a solid main event. You're going to have a triple threat match with Triple H, Chris Jericho, and Stephanie Mc... Um, Stephanie! The... <laughs> they went on about Stephanie all night on this show, by the way. They, they you know, did. Because that's usually what they do. And I noticed that for most of the night, they just called her Stephanie. Yeah. I guess because even though she's getting divorced, they, they can call her Stephanie McMahon. They says so Stephanie, Stephanie, Stephanie. And I also noticed her talking to Michael Cole, and I just want to point out that anytime I see Michael Cole on any of these old shows, he looks like a complete toolbox. <laughs> he, had the, he? Uh, he had the goatee. Um, was he had the? He had the um, frizz. He had the the, the, the frizzy yeah. hair or whatever. The, the frosted tips on the hair. You know, it's 2002, man. Toolbox. Um, that's that's what people did. So, well, here's the setup. So, like you said, they talk about Stephanie on the whole entire show. The setup is a Triple H pin Stephanie. She's gone. And she's never coming back to Raw. Ever. Ever. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm willing to make that bet. Uh, if uh, I don't know. Even in 2002, she I would have made that She did stay bet. away from Raw for a while. She did. Yeah, um, nice little boy, while. Did she come back with a, with a bang? Um, yeah. So Triple H, uh, still using the My Time here. My Time theme, my time theme here, by the way. Um, Stephanie used the My Time. Yep. So... Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Stephanie was using it. Sorry, Triple H, um, had the, Triple H already had the other one by now. Yeah, yeah. Stephanie's using uh, my time here, and so this match. I mean, <laughs> again, I think reference um, the year uh, a lot goes into this because Stephanie <laughs> was was not just standing around in this match. Um, she got uh, thrown she about and thrown around. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, <laughs> Jericho shoved her down. Uh, Triple H kicked her. Um, <laughs> just a lot of it was a lot of stuff um, for poor Stephanie here. Uh, as usual, you were not going to get just a completely normal thing here, um, where you know Stephanie at one point gets a two on Triple H. She tries to get the two on Jericho. That leads to uh, Triple H hitting a clothesline on Stephanie. My God. And then Jericho goes for the walls. Jericho, uh, Stephanie jumps on Jericho's back. Um, he uses a snapmare on her. Like Stephanie took some bumps in this match. Yeah. Um, she did not shy away from that. Um, and then it's uh, Triple H uh, hitting the pedigree on Jericho. Stephanie breaks it up. Uh, Triple H hits the spine buster on Stephanie to win it. So, so you're telling me Stephanie didn't mind getting physical to Triple H is what you're saying there. Well, there was a lot of physicality in All this right. match. Um, that is what I will tell you. Um, Jericho so still kind of awkward, didn't he? I was gonna say he, uh, yeah. I don't know what's he doing in there. Like what um, the hell? <laughs> that, that 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 live sex celebration would not be for several years later. No. Um, Stephanie is done on Raw. She's never coming back to Raw. Uh, write it down. March twenty fifth, two thousand two. Um, Triple H waves bye to her. Security escorts her out. We get the na 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 na. Hey, oh, yeah. Bye, gotta so do on. that. Yeah, and um, so we get all that. So that was that was Raw. Um, that was the draft Raw. This was not a, a show that I think if you go back. Like it, it held up to me just because, again, I think it's all the people. Like it's just the star power you've got all over this place. Like we said, you have a Taz, Mr. Perfect match. You've got um, Edge, Christian, DDP, Booker T. Uh, you know, it's just like Rock Hogan, the NWO. I mean, it's like there's just, there's so many like stars that you look back on and you're like, my goodness, what a roster this was. Um, but I mean, the draft, it, it was just so different at the time. I know you can look back now and be like, well, why the hell did, you know, Vince make this pick or Flair make this pick, but it's like I thought it was fun for what it was. Well, they made the they made dumb picks because they were too wrapped up in each other's <laughs> nonsense, pretty much. It was yes. kind of a story there. Yeah. But they, I mean, they weren't all dumb picks. We we point out some of the good ones early on. They kind of went off the rails. I mean, uh, we're speaking of busts. I think picking Mark Henry that high in two thousand two. Yeah, it's um. So if you go through the list. Raw had The Undertaker, The NWO, Kane, RVD, Booker T, Big Show, Bubba Ray Dudley, Brock Lesnar, William Regal, Lita. SmackDown, The Rock, Angle, Benoit, Hogan, Billy and Chuck, Edge, Rikishi, Devon, Mark Henry, <laughs> Maven. 
<laughs> one, of, one of these not like the others. Um, just, yeah, it kind of fell. Out. Like I said, it kind of fell out towards the end there. I mean, that when he you, was the you hardcore could, champ, though. I mean, I mean Rock, yeah. Angle, Benoit, Hogan, Billy Chuck, Edge. That's that's not bad. And then you kind of kind of fall off the cliff there. Well, it wasn't the twenty four seven era. I mean, he like you know, Maven wasn't like all over both shows and running around. Hell, and... then, well, I mean, the issue was that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what happened was that's not quite what ended up happening because yeah. as it turns out R- maven lost the title to raven maven <laughs> and raven oh god that's just fucking brilliant uh, that's the uh i mean that's what aw's got to do that at some point you got to have the double maven page. raven you double, have the maven raven page. you got the cages you got yeah. uh, the pages oh gosh uh, give me uh give me a fatal four-way with uh <laughs> ethan page um hangman page christian cage brian cage that's that's all i want so um anyways so of course they do the draft lottery afterwards and um i I mean i'm just gonna run these down quickly we don't have to obviously talk about every one of them but i'm just gonna run through this and we can pick and choose what we want to discuss so raw gets bradshaw stephen richards matt hardy raven jeff hardy mr perfect spike deadly d'lo brown sean stasiak terry reynolds jacqueline gold dust trish stratus why is she all the way down there just incredible, big boss man, Tommy Dreamer, Crash Holly, Mighty Molly. Well, That's I'm pretty it. sure these weren't. I th- I'm pretty sure they weren't. They were just lo- lottery, right? The, the, yeah, they I just think like it lottery was just balls. Random picks, I guess. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, you gotta get random picks at some point so these people don't feel bad about themselves. <laughs> yes, because so, you know, wrestlers are a sensitive bunch. We know this. Well, exactly. So that's the random randomization for Raw, SmackDown, Billy Kidman, Tajiri. Jericho, who, of course, um, as we know, lost the match, so he goes to smack down there. Ivory, Albert, the Hurricane, Al Snow, Landstorm, DDP, Tori Wilson, Scotty Tuhati, Stacey Keebler, Christian, Test, Farouk, Taz, Hardcore Holly, Val Venus, Perry Saturn. That's your SmackDown uh, rest of the group there. So, yeah. Um, so, I don't really know what... I mean, we know what all this would lead to, and, and again, you still have... Triple H is the undisputed champion. Of course, he's going back and forth at the time. Jazz, WWF Women's Champion, same situation. Uh, Stephanie, gone. Austin, in a bidding war, apparently, uh, to try to get Austin. But this was interesting. Like, I think you look back on it, like they've honed the draft process, or they did, at least for a while. Like, now, I don't even know what, uh, you know, it's just random pop-ups on a screen. But um, this was still, I thought it it was fun for what it was. And at least at the time, like you remember back and you're thinking, okay, this is something completely new, completely different. And so I give them credit because they did have a roster. We talk about the talent, like just again, look at all the names we've just mentioned here in this span of this podcast. Like there are just so many people we look back on and be like, oh yeah, that's a hall of famer. Like there's, there's so many of those. And it's just like, it made sense at the time. Like you just had such a huge roster. Yeah, uh, that's that's just what you have to do when you have the, that many people on a roster. You had all, everybody coming there from WCW and ECW. Just and uh, like we said, like I said, I, I think the company in the past did a lot better when it had competition than when it didn't, because that yeah. competition would kind of uh, motivate them to uh, to step things up. And I think the idea was to have Raw and SmackDown uh, different different rosters. They had different writing teams as well, so the idea was that uh, the writing teams and the wrestlers would strive to be better than each other. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and we know too, like just having different brands. Obviously, there was a lot more pen- potential for money because you could, you know, you do two separate loops and that kind of stuff, and so yep. it just, yeah, I mean, it it made a lot of sense. And like we said, it's not like they were lacking star power when you when you go up and down this roster. Um, you know, eventually I think you would see like there were certain portions um uh, that kind of went off the rails in terms of the booking and that kind of stuff on certain parts, but um it it was interesting. Like I, I went back and watched this and I'm just thinking, you know what the biggest thing was stood out to me, and, and I'm not even joking, like this was the thing of all the stuff we just discussed, like draft, rock, hogan, like NWO, all the star power. First thing I thought of was it's two hours. Raw's two hours. Like, <laughs> like that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, oh my God, like what is this? Like Shocking, this, right? an hour and a half worth of actual, you know, stuff. Like uh, it's just it's gosh, it's just And I think oh. they, they took more care back in this time period too to uh make the make the roster seem even. Yeah. I mean, even if uh Lawler would say on commentary McMahon was winning the draft or whatever, the when you take a look at the top ten, it, it looked pretty even to me. 
Yeah. And when you take a look at the draft fly results, it, it seems like even even rosters. And when you go th- throughout 2002, I think for the most part, the shows were kind of even. SmackDown kind of broke out towards the end of the year when you had the SmackDown 6 and Heyman writing stuff and whatnot. But I think for at least for the first part of this uh, whole draft uh, brand extension era, era you had uh, two equal shows. Yeah, it's um, it's fun. I, I'm, now that Peacock has added, which of course it's been all been on the network for years, but now that Peacock has gone in and added all the SmackDowns from you know O two and that era right there, because initially they only had the I guess the past three seasons or whatever. Um, I think it'd be interesting to go back. I may watch some of that and just sort of refresh my memory on some of that stuff because it, it was really good. I think in the early going, but as we know, um, eventually things sort of veer off course sometimes. Uh, when it comes to uh, WWE's booking, which um, yeah, that's we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. But um, I think this was, yeah, this was a fun kind of, you know, visit down memory lane to look back at this edition of the draft. And like we said, uh, there is, I assume WWE is going to be doing their draft again. And I think it was, I don't remember, September, something like that seems to be the aim. And, and you can sort of see that they're, I guess, setting up ideas for that, which the whole Drew McIntyre thing, everyone thinks he's jumping to SmackDown after losing to, to Lashley and, you know, not going to get a chance to title again with Lashley champion. So I don't know. Um, but I, I don't know that this year's drafts can have the same impact as the one from 2002. And now I'm kind of, I've clicked over the big boss man's Wikipedia page because I was trying to remember what did big boss man do on raw in 2002? I don't remember anything. And the answer is, Oh my God, he formed the short lived tag team with Mr. Perfect. Did he? Wow. I don't okay, remember that. Yeah, on April 1st, episode of Raw, they lost to the Hardy Boys. Wow. I fell. That might have been the short. That might have been it, actually. <laughs> it's that's very short lived. They lost the Hardy Boys, and that was it, because <laughs> then, he's, then he's dropping matches. He's wrestling on heat for like the rest of April and May. Wow. His final WWE match was on May 26th, uh, episode of Heat, and he loses to Tommy Dreamer. Hmm. Like, think about that. Taz, Mr. Perfect, Tommy Dreamer, Big Boss Man. Like, that's just, they all interacted in 2002. And somebody tell Tommy Dreamer that he was the man who drove Big Boss Man out of WWE. <laughs> I wonder if he, he probably remembers that. Yeah, he, he probably he probably tells people to this day, hey, I'm the one that ran Big Boss Man out of town. That's right. right. No, I wouldn't blame him. Like, that's, um, yeah, so that's a feat. So, I don't, yeah, this was just, um, man, you go up and down this roster, and you're just thinking, like, it's, it's, it's still interesting to think, like, a lot of these guys are, some of these guys are still, you know, like their edge, like edge was like edge is about to fight for the, the title. Like he's, you know, and it's just like, man, there's so many, I don't know. It's uh, it's interesting to look back on, of course, RVD, Billy Gunn's still active. I, I've said this, like Billy Gunn is not aged in 20 years. Um, so, Billy's aged a lot less than edge has. That's for sure. I was going to say like, Billy, we, I feel like we've had this discussion before. Like Billy Gunn is 57 years old. Like he, I just don't even know what to say. Like this guy is just, I don't know. He, um, I, if you want to go back and watch, like this guy, I'm telling you, he doesn't look that much different. You know, I kind of was, Billy Gunn is 57. I had the similar shocked reaction when I read earlier. Tyler Brace is 33. I was wow. like, what? Not really? <laughs> hmm. See, that's another interesting one. Something I failed to mention in this, and I forgot to mention earlier because he was part of the uh, the lottery. But Tajiri was actually he was the cruiserweight champion, so that made the cruiserweight title exclusive to SmackDown. Um. I don't remember. I just don't remember a whole lot about what they did with that. Um, at that point, I, like I remember, I guess eventually what it became, but I can't remember like what Tajiri's feuds would have been early on. I assume like Kidman, London. So Jerry was the cruiser, yeah, the cruiserweight champion. So uh, yeah, I feel like Ray, looking at the Ray roster, Mysterio came in in two thousand two as well. So yeah. I assume. I, that, I assume that's right. That's the, yeah. Because it was Kidman was on SmackDown, Tajiri was on there. Um, I assume, man, you know, Hurricane, Scotty Too Hotty, those kind of. I assume that's that was probably the the deal. Um, but yeah, I'm looking at the Cruiserweight title. Let's see. Oh man, lots of title changes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Billy Kidman wins the title on April second. Yeah. Tajiri wins it back April twenty first. You got the Hurricane showing up there. Yeah. And then that's you got Jamie fun. Noble, Billy Kidman, Matt Hardy. Okay, so there you go. That's right. Noble came in not long after. Oh, that Jamie, too, no, it was that Noble was doing the trailer park gimmick too. Oh, that was yeah good with Nidia. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That was, um, there, there was a lot of great stuff. Like I, that was good shit. That's though. what this, this, this draft. Like it, 
it led to some good stuff. I'll give them that. So um, that was the first uh, WWF, which again had not gotten the F out yet, uh, draft 2002, the uh, March 25th edition of Raw. Uh, with the actual uh, draft uh, brand split in place uh, starting on April the 1st. So uh, it would start uh, the following week there. But uh, Steve, it was fun to take a trip down this as you and I laughed about uh, last time. I think sometimes people probably uh, enjoy this more than some <laughs> some of the current stuff at this point. Um, I'm not going to not gonna bash anybody or anything, but uh, I think some of it's sometimes a lot more entertaining to look back on some of this than it is um some of the some of the current uh issues i guess with the product so well i know we're we're looking back around here and that gives me a good segue to plug uh some of my upcoming yes. stuff and on 41mania.com pretty soon uh, we'll be looking back with the kind of a uh tip of the hat to the current day because nxt of course has a great american bash coming up here pretty soon so i thought it'd be a good time to look back at some of the best great american bash moments so and yeah, it's, it's mostly WCW stuff. Uh, well, more NWA stuff, to be honest with you, because that's when all the good stuff was, kids. Mid eighties, <laughs> <laughs> early nineties. You know, that's when that's when the good stuff was. I'm sorry, I can't, I, I don't know what to tell you. I didn't have. I I had one X, NXT thing. None of these stuff from the mid from the mid two thousands. Because oh gosh, those those SmackDown brand Great American Bashes were those. <laughs> that usually was the worst show of the year. <laughs> Or at least in the conversation. It, was, it always seemed to be a bad one. Well, I thought I was going to mention, like, it's funny you segue that. I was going to say, like, not all the brand split stuff was good because I think right now still, if you had to ask me what's one of the worst pay-per-views WWE-wise I've, well, I've seen. And, and again, I think there's, over the past probably 10 years, a lot kind of gets lost <laughs> because of just, I don't know. Um, there's just been so many. But Great American Bash 2004. Oh, oh that, yeah, that one still stands out to me. Um, I, was just, I was just reading about that one the other day. Yeah, <laughs> wow. There's a, there's a lot of stuff on that show. As a, a Billy Gunn on that show against <laughs> Kenzo Suzuki, uh, Hardcore Holly against Mordecai. Uh, oh my god. Oh my. Yeah, there's just uh, Tori Wilson Sable had a memorable counter. Luther Ray, uh, Charlie Haas. <laughs> you had the uh, you had the JBL Eddie Guerrero title change, which was awful. Uh, oh you had uh, Paul Bear getting murdered assassinate on live television <laughs> Ooh, this was yeah like if you look back I you card, do murder <laughs> no S sable and tori wilson like you said uh and of course the main event was the undertaker against the dudley boys in a concrete con concrete crypt match that was just my goodness where paul Bear um, got assassinated for no apparent reason yeah it wasn't good um Ugh. that i cannot recommend going back to watch that but i can recommend checking out uh steve's great american bash top seven moments from it um i've already looked at it it's going to be up soon may actually be up by the time you listen to this podcast but uh his number four um that's a match i remember and you want to talk about one of the finishes that i hate the most in the history of wrestling uh is the number four on his list so i will i will leave that as a teaser um it, it, the rematch is true well is all i can say about yes that. it did that is absolutely <laughs> right but my goodness that the one that you have at number four i I still, to this day, like I remember watching this and I'm just like, and I went back and watched it not long ago uh, for some reason, but I was just like, I hate it every time I see it. But, the only uh, problem, the only problem was the guy never guys <laughs> come up and so he just, he no. came up short and that kind of killed his career for, yes, it, it, you know, it didn't completely kill the guy's career, but uh, yeah, it definitely led to it being uh, less than it could have been. Yep, number four. There's your teaser. Uh, check it out. Check out all seven. Uh, find it over at mania.com. You can check out everything we else, everything else we have going on over there. Um, all of our coverage, uh, news, reviews, all that good stuff. Uh, so check it out and uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, any podcast app you use. You can search for it there. As always, uh, we'll have the link to the GoFundMe uh, for Larry Sonkin's family in the show notes. So be sure to contribute and share if you can. And uh, yeah, everything else you need, 411mania.com. Uh, thanks as always uh, for listening to the podcast, and uh, we'll talk to you next time here on the 411 on Wrestling Podcast.